Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful sunshine today, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for being our God, your grace, your mercy that you extend to us. It's something that we can't even, I don't think we can fully comprehend how much you love us. And we thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, we just ask this morning as we finish up the Gospel of Matthew that you just speak to our hearts, Lord, about what the Gospel is and, and really what it isn't. We know your character. We know your love. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we just pray, minister to our hearts this morning, encourage us. And Lord, as always, as we worship you, may it come from our heart out of love. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We will be reading from Psalm 9 this morning. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne, judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins and you have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. The Lord will also be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds. For he who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. You who lift me up, from the gates of death, that I may tell of all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made, in the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known, he has executed judgment, in the work of his own hands the wicked is snared. The wicked will return to Sheol, even all the nations who forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28 as we finish up our study in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. And I know last week we covered these verses in detail, and this morning we're going to deal with an issue that I believe is related to the Great Commission that Jesus gave us, and it, I think it goes against it. And here's the issue. It's Calvinism or Reformed theology. Now, some of you may not even know what that means, and you may be thinking, why is this even important? It doesn't even affect me. I hate to say it, it is going to affect you. It is very important, especially in the days we're living in, because there is a new push for Calvinism or Reformed theology to be accepted. And I think there is a very dark side to Calvinism that some Calvinists will talk about, and others want to just ignore because it is a dark side. They don't want to talk about it. Now, understand that for most Calvinists, those who believe in uh, Calvinism, don't try to bring people to Jesus because it's a futile attempt to try and convert someone who is not predestined or elected to be saved. So this is what they'll do. They will spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, trying to convert the already saved to Calvinism. And if you believe in Calvinism or Reformed theology, as you'll see, there's really not a desire to bring that gospel message to every creature. The Great Commission is kind of futile, if you think about it. And... The other reason that I'm bringing this up 
is that Reformed theology, Calvinism, is coming into Calvary Chapel. As some of you saw the memorial service for Pastor Chuck who founded Calvary Chapel, and what was interesting to me is that at the service we saw, saw Reformed theology pastors given a platform to speak, men like you know, Mark Driscoll and uh, James McDonald. You think, well, how can that be? And some will say, well, it was a memorial service, and you know, Pastor Chuck you know, touched a lot of people, and that's the reason. And I disagree with that. I disagree, not because I'm so smart, but I think that they are trying to get us comfortable with Reformed theology pastors. And I'll give you a couple statements, and you'll see where the things are going. And keep in mind, there were many who were waiting for Pastor Chuck to go and be with the Lord so that they could go forward with their agenda. It's kind of sad, but true. This is a tweet from a Calvary Chapel pastor from 2012, from the 2012 Calvary Chapel Senior Pastors Conference. This is what he tweeted, and this is one of the reasons why I don't go to the conferences, and I haven't for a long time. But this is what he tweeted. Kind words about Pastor Mark Driscoll, Tim Keller, and Francis Chan from Senior Calvary Chapel Leadership. The senior leadership of Calvary Chapel said they are friends and partners in the gospel. Calvary Chapel pastors were given permission to build bridges with other tribes, like Acts 29 and the Gospel Coalition. A critic of Pastor Chuck and what he stood for wrote this. He said, another part of the new attitude was the expect expressed desire to build bridges, not walls, with people of other traditions, including the dreaded new Calvinists like Mark Driscoll, Mars Hill, Acts 29, and the Gospel Coalition, and possibly old ones too. Another, another critic of where Calvary Chapel is at, and instead of staying the course, they want to change the course, and this is what he said. Here's how and why the potential replacement, replacing Pastor Chuck, group wins. He has the young guys. The young guys are the future. The old dudes are going to die off soon. The church planners are planting the seeds for Calvary Chapel's future. And the guys I'm follow following from Calvary Chapel who are doing the planting sure ap appear to be good guys promoting good things. And it reminded me so much of what Rick Warren said, that you know people who refuse to follow his ways, they're either going to die off or leave the church. Well, I hope I have a few more years to bring the gospel message forward, but what a sad statement. There are many, many more hostile quotes, and there are many closet Calvary pastors that are Reformed theology, and I think they're coming out of the closet. I think they're coming to the forefront now that Pastor Chuck has gone to be with the Lord, and they're trying to lead other Calvary Chapel pastors down the same path. Now, let me say this before I move on. Calvinist Reformed theology followers are brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm not saying that they are not saved. What I'm saying is that their doctrine is off, and it's a dangerous doctrine because it makes God look like the bad guy, that man isn't responsible for the condition that he's in. And in fact, he has no choice in the matter. Not even Adam had a choice in what he did. That's just plain foolishness and unbiblical. And what they want to do is come and evangelize us so we can come, I guess, into the fullness of what God has for us, Reformed theology. Now, I have never met anyone and I have never read about someone being saved as a Calvinist of Reformed theology. I've never heard that before. And I've read others and they've never heard of it. What happens is they came to the theology after they got saved. Someone taught them these things, which is interesting to me. They didn't need Reformed theology to be saved, right? They needed the gospel message. Although, as we're going to see this morning, they believe that Calvinism and the gospel are one and the same, but they're not, far from it. And that's why this is important, because we're told to go and bring the gospel, the Great Commission, to the world, right? So if Calvinism is the gospel, then that's what we need to bring to people. But if it's not, then yeah, obviously we shouldn't. Now, because you're not born again into Calvinism, you have to be taught this so you can come to the greater knowledge. Now, that's interesting to me, right? If Calvinism is the gospel, then how can anyone come to the faith apart from accepting Calvinism? And they don't have any real good answer for it. They do try to explain it. F.E. Hamilton, he put it like this. 
He said, a blind, deaf, and dumb man can, it is true, know something of the world about him through the senses remaining, but his knowledge will be very imperfect and probably inaccurate. In a similar way, a Christian who never knows or never accepts the deeper teachings of the Bible, which Calvinism embodies, may be a Christian, but he will be a very imperfect Christian, and it should be the duty of those who know the whole truth to attempt to lead him into the only storehouse which contains the full riches of true Christianity. You mean you got saved not knowing the whole truth? That's an elitist mentality. Well, what if you don't accept Calvinism and you're born again? Well, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal in the end. According to Lorraine Botner, she said, we are not all Calvinists as we travel the road to heaven, but we shall all be Calvinists when we get there. <laughs> well, how does that work? How do I become a Calvinist if I'm not a Calvinist now? Well, Spurgeon kind of fills it in. He says, God will wash your brains before you enter heaven. <laughs> so get rid of all that garbage that's in your brains about the gospel of Jesus Christ open to all men and will replace it with Calvinism. Wow. Now, again, I don't know if you think this is important, but I do. I think this is related directly to this Great Commission. And I think it's important. And again, there is such a push today. John MacArthur, at one of his uh, lectures, said that he felt that Reformed theology was, was a gift from heaven given to us. And I disagree with that. And you're going to see why, because it's a very dark side to Calvinism. And I don't want to offend anyone. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. But I want you to understand that if you believe in Calvinism, there is a very dark side to it. It's not what the picture that they try to paint. And some of them actually do speak on this. Others don't. They try to ignore it. Now, George, George Bryson wrote this regarding what we see happening in the church today. He said, the non-reformed evangelical community in general, and Calvary Chapel in particular, are facing a serious challenge from the reformed community. Sometimes the challenge is from outside non-Calvinist churches and associations, and sometimes it is from inside non-Calvinist associations, such as Calvary Chapel. From reformed churches and associations of various kinds, represented by men like R.C. Sproul, uh, John MacArthur, John Piper, Mark Driscoll, uh, C.J. Mahaney, Al Mohler, J.I. Packer, and the Reformed pastors, theologians, and apologists. Then there are those Calvinists seemingly less concerned about trying to win all non-Calvinists over to Calvinism. Now, he said all of these men and all of their associations represent a threat to non-Reformed evangelicalism and Calvary Chapel only if we do not know the difference between what I call the Reformed doctrines of grace, the five points of Calvinism, what I believe and what I call the biblical doctrines of grace, and if we do not know what their goal agenda is. We have nothing to fear from these men and the kinds of Calvinism they represent except the biblical and theological ignorance on our part. One of the claims that some Calvinists make is that most, if not all, the great biblical scholars and theologically sharp thinkers are and have been for hundreds of years uh, soteriologic, soteriologically reformed. This is utter nonsense. A second claim made by many Calvinists is that Calvinism provides the greatest incentive to evangelism and missions, and the most, if not all, the great missionaries of the present and past were are reformed. This claim is also bogus because these myths sometimes sell many Christians, some Calvary Chapel pastors included, are vulnerable. Now think about it. What did we do before Calvinism was even invented? I guess they were just uneducated. And that's kind of the thing. You know, what I thought about as I was studying this is it reminded me of Gnosticism. Not that this is a, this is a cult, but Gnosticism was knowledge. And it was knowledge that I'm superior to you. I have some kind of intellectual knowledge, and you're not as smart as me. Now, I may not be as smart as you, but I just know what God's Word says, and I believe it. Why can't we trust what God's Word has to say? Why do we have to follow a man? You know, as I said before, I don't want you going around saying, Pastor Joe said, because that's meaningless. Who is Pastor Joe? Who is that goofball? I want you to say, it is written, or the Bible says, not what some man says. 
And so I think this is a very, very important topic. It's related to our study here in Matthew 28, as you'll see, the gospel. And so let's pick up Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 16, and let's see what the Lord has for us as we look at the Great Commission and Reformed Theology. Matthew said, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all these things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Notice that that Jesus is commissioning, he's commanding his men to go throughout the whole world with the gospel message. And he has the authority to do this because he is almighty God. And it's not just his men, he's commissioning all of us. He not only has the authority, he has the power to enable us to accomplish what he's called us to do. We need to walk in that. And it's not just making disciples, it's baptizing them as the evidence for their faith. It's teaching them the things of God so that they can grow in their relationship with God. And as scary as this may be to do, the Lord says he'll be with us until the end of the age, until we go to be with him. You see, then the work, you might say, is over. We enter into eternity with Jesus. Now, according to Calvinism or Reformed theology, there is no point to this statement. You see, their doctrinal beliefs go against what Jesus said, the commission he's given to us. And I'm going to just share real quickly these five points of Calvinism and see if they're biblical. And let me say this. You cannot be a four-point Calvinist or a three-point Calvinist. You have to either believe in all five points or you're not a Calvinist. That's just the reality. Again, Botner points this out. She said, these are not isolated and independent doctrines, but are so interrelated that they form a simple, harmonious, self-consistent system, and the way in which they fit together as a component parts of a well-ordered whole has won the admiration of thinking men of all creeds. Prove any one of them true, and all the others will follow as a logical and necessary parts of the system. Prove any one of them false, and the whole system must be abandoned. They are found to dovetail perfectly into the other. So in other words, you have to believe in all five of these points. If you are a true Calvinist, you can't just believe in one or two or three or four of them even. And you'll see that none of these hold any water. The five points are called TULIP. It's an acronym. And each of these letters represent a point in Calvinism. And so we'll bring, begin with the letter T in TULIP. And T represents total depravity. And that means man is unable to come to Christ, and thus God must regenerate us, and then we're saved. And one of the verses that are used here is Ephesians 2.8. And this is how J.I. Packer translates this verse. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It either faith as such or salvation and faith together is the gift of God. In other words, what's being said is man has no free will in this matter. It's all predetermined by God. Faith is not a means of salvation to those in Reformed theology group. Faith is a gift of God. No person, unregenerated person, can believe unless and until the person is regenerated, and only God can do that. Now, are they right in saying that faith and salvation is a gift of God and we have no part in it? Is that what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians? I don't think so. New Testament Greek scholar Harold W. Honer explains it like this. He said, Much debate is centered around the demonstrative pronoun thus. Though some think it refers back to grace and others to faith, neither of these suggestions is really valid because the demonstrative pronoun is neuter, whereas grace and faith are feminine. And so, in other words, this salvation does not have its source in man. It's not from yourselves, but rather its source is God's grace. It's a gift of God, but we have the faith, we have to believe. And that's really what it's all about. Can we, apart from being regenerated first by God, believe? Well, I think the Bible's clear on that. But Reformed theology says man is too depraved to have the faith to believe. God has to regenerate and then save you. And man is free from any part of this. And that's just a very disturbing doctrine. This total depravity 
man is in absolute bondage to sin and Satan, he can't exercise his own will to trust in Jesus Christ without the help of God, without God saving him, regenerating him. And yet, in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, the way to receive the spiritual birth, which then gives us the right to become children of God, is that we need to receive Jesus Christ. And that involves believing in the name of Jesus Christ. We have a role. We have a choice. We have to receive and believe that by faith. Think about Adam. Let's play it out with Adam. When Adam sinned, I think we would all agree that he was spiritually dead, right? But here's a problem for Calvinists. After Adam sinned, after he was spiritually dead, did he still hear the voice of God? Well, absolutely. You could just go into Genesis chapter 3, and God was talking to Adam after he had sinned, and he was telling him the consequences of his actions. So yeah, he did hear the voice of God. God spoke to him. Well, how can this be when in total depravity, man can no longer hear God? Well, just because a, spirit, a man is spiritually dead doesn't mean he cannot believe the gospel when it's presented to him. Is that what happened to you? Because that's what happened with me. Luke 15, 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What must the sinner do? Repent and come to Christ. That's what he needs to do. He has to do that. Another one, 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whoever what? Believes. You see that? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, whoever believes. It's a choice on our part. John 20, verse 31. But these are written, the miracles recorded in the Gospel of John, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Acts 17.30 Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Who's called to repent? Man. That means man has a choice. 1 John 5.13, John said, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You know, I definitely believe we are all sinners and, uh, and unable by human performance to save ourselves. Works can never save us. We don't deserve salvation. It's a free gift. It's the grace of God. Our part is that we must believe and it's not work, that's faith. In John 6, 29, Jesus said, you know, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So total depravity is not scriptural in the sense that Calvinists view it. We can, by faith, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a choice. And we'll see that over and over, that there's definitely a choice. Well, the second one in the TULIP acronym is you, unconditional election. And the Calvinists believe that God elects man to be saved, and it's not based at all upon the decision of man, but it's the free will of God to choose whoever he wants to save. Calvin explained it like this. He said, by, predestin by predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God, by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or the other of those ends, we say that he has been predestined to life or death. Now, I don't know, that's disturbing to me. It paints a disturbing picture of God for me. Philip Schaff put it like this, What will become of the immense majority of human beings who live and die without God and without hope in the world? Is this terrible fact due to the eternal counsel of God or to the free agency of man? The Calvinist system involves a positive truth, the election to eternal life by faith, and the negative inference, the reprobation to eternal death by arbitrary justice. Now think about that. Is there such a thing as arbitrary justice? No. 
That makes no sense. It's an oxymoron. The two words contradict each other. And it, it, it paints a very dark side of Calvinism. Botner said this, the doctrine of absolute predestination, of course, logically holds that some are foreordained to death as truly as others are foreordained to life. The very terms elect and election imply the terms non-elect and reprobation. When some are chosen out, others are left not chosen. The high privileges and glorious destiny of the former are not shared with the latter. This too is of God. We, we believe that from all eternity, God is intended to leave some of Adam's posterity in their sins, and that the decisive factor in the life of each is to be found only in God's will. So according to Calvinism, in order for a lost person to be saved, they must be among the special group of people, kind of like a caste system called the elect. If you were created by God to go to hell, there's nothing you could do to go to heaven. You have no choice in the matter. Now, if there's... If you're chosen by God to go to heaven, well, good for you. Because there's nothing you could do to get out of that. I like the way George Bryson kind of pictures this. He says, imagine 100 people trapped in a burning building and the fire captain saying to his crew, I know you can save all the people trapped in this building, but I have no interest in saving them all. For reasons that I will not divulge at this time, or perhaps for reasons you cannot now understand, I want you to let 75 of these people perish in the flames. It's not our fault they are in this predicament, and we owe them nothing. It is their own fault that they are now about to go down in flames. But that is not why I'm going to leave them to burn to death. I have chosen to express my love and show mercy only on 25 of them. As for the rest, let them burn. Here's the list of people I want you to save. Now go save them and leave the rest to perish. My choice is simply to save some and not to save others. Those I have chosen to save, I have also chosen to use in the fire department once they are rescued. Once we get them out of harm's way, I will give them their working assignments and all the tools they will need to do the job, I will give them. Now, he says, you know, this whole Calvinist scheme is even more sinister in that God is setting the very fire for which he chooses, for his own pleasure, not to rescue some people. Now, let's look at a different rescue mission that takes place at sea. Suppose 100 people have been swept overboard in this terrible, terrible storm. Suppose they put themselves in harm's way by, by going out onto the deck when they were specifically warned not to do so. Suppose when this perilous situation comes to the captain's attention, with compassion and a sense of urgency in his voice, he immediately tells his rescue crew, Make every effort to reach every person with a life preserver and to bring him or her back to safety. The captain then tells his crew, make no distinction between those overboard. Throw life preservers to everyone. Once they get aboard ship, I will give each person rescued an assignment on the ship with all the tools he will need to do the job I will give him to do. Suppose the crew rises to the occasion and successfully gets a life preserver to everyone overboard. Suppose, however, that for whatever reason, some of those overboard choose not to accept the help offered to them. Suppose some want to commit suicide and others simply believe they can save themselves by some other means. In both stories, some are saved and some are lost, right? In the first story, however, things turn out just the way the captain wants them to. The ones he wants to save, he saves. The ones he doesn't want to save, perish. But the second story, the captain really wants to save everyone and makes provision to do so. The only thing he doesn't do is force anyone to accept the help he offers. In the first story, the elect are saved because they are elect. That is, they are saved because the captain elects them, elects to save them. In the second story, the saved are elected to serve because they are saved. The captain wants to save everyone. He chooses to, to use all of those that are saved in accordance with the fact that they will receive the help offered in the saving process. With he ends this by saying, "With no analogy is per while no analogy is perfect, the fire captain represents the God of Cal Calvinism, and the ship's captain represents the God of the Bible." Absolutely. I mean, what kind of picture of God are we painting here? Even John MacArthur and John Piper believe that God really wants to save the lost. He just chose not to do so. Well, does that even help you? What good is that? I want to save you, but I'm just choosing not to. Well, thanks for that. That doesn't help me. And that's not the God of the Bible. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if God desires all men to be saved, why do we see so many dying apart from being saved? The Calvinists would say, well, that's God's will, right? But the Bible says very simply, that's man's choice. Free will. You have a choice. God has provided the means. You didn't accept it. John Piper tells us Christ is the Savior of all men. He is especially the Savior of those who believe. The death of Christ actually saves from all evil those for whom Christ died especially. So Jesus came to save all men from their sins, but man has a choice to make, and whatever he chooses, God can't be blamed unless, unless you're a Calvinist, and then God's predetermined you to go to hell, not to be saved. That's what they're saying. And then how evil is this God of Calvinism? Peter says, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter 3.9. For the Calvinist, what God does is he stretches out his hand to rescue those he wants to save, but he's also stretching out his hand, kind of teasing. Here, Reach out. Come on. Oh, just kidding. You can't get saved because you're not the elect. That makes no sense. You see, that's not the God I serve. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who's he calling? All, right? Come to me. That's a choice. That's something I must do. But for the Calvinists, only those who, that God has chosen can come. And let's think about this. How could God, how can a holy, righteous, just God hold man accountable for not trusting in Jesus when God has determined that he can't trust Jesus? Think about that. It, it can't happen. That God would be unjust. He would be unfair. He would be unrighteous in his actions. And we know that's not true. As you look at the scriptures, it speaks of God choosing man, and it also speaks of man accepting the invitation to salvation. God's sovereignty, man's free will. And I'll talk about more th about that in a little bit, because I think they work together. I think they run side by side, as we're going to see. So Calvinism is wrong. There's nothing to support unconditional election. The third point is limited atonement. And again, this is crazy. The idea here is that Jesus only died for some people, not for the world. It's a limited atonement. You know, the, you know the song, you know, nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? But for the Calvinists, there's a dark side to that because there's also nothing in the blood of Jesus to atone for sin for some. The ones that Jesus did not die for. John Owen had the nerve to say, the scripture nowhere says Christ died for all men. What Bible are you reading? You see, it reminded me a lot about the debate with Bill Nye and Ken Ham, where Bill Nye would just say things that weren't true about creation. This is Ken Ham's doctrine. Well, no, it's not. It's the Bible's. It's not Ken. Ken didn't come up with the doctrine of creation. The Bible did. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Pretty simple. But again, false information. And think about it. Where is the good news? Where is the gospel message that we're to bring to the lost and dying world if God only di died for a select few? The Great Commission in Matthew 28 becomes the great omission because many are left out of the kingdom because Jesus didn't shed his blood for them. Wayne Grudem s sees it like this, and listen carefully how brilliant people can miss the point. Reformed people argue that if Christ's death actually paid for the sins of every person who ever lived, then there is no penalty left for anyone to pay. And it necessarily follows that all people will be saved without exception. For God could not condemn to eternal punishment anyone whose sins are already paid for. That would be demanding double payment and would therefore be unjust. Well, to make his point, he has to ignore a very important point. The atonement has been provided for all, but the atonement has not been appropriated by all. Isn't that simple? I mean... I don't know why this is so complicated. Christ died for all, not all receive it. 
1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. For all. How was the atonement limited when Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all? And all, guess what, means all. It's there for every single person who's ever lived to receive that gift. John MacArthur says in regards to the Lord that his sacrifice was sufficient to pay the penalty for all the sins of all who God brings to faith. But the actual satisfaction and atonement was made only for those who believe. Well, again, that makes no sense to me. How does God die for all the sins of the world and yet it's only for a limited few? It doesn't make sense. First John 2.2 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Yes, thank God. I'm so thankful. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.19, that Christ was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, as, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. It's pretty straightforward. But John MacArthur sees this verse a little differently. He wrote, the word world should not be interpreted in any universalistic sense, which would say that everyone will be saved or even potentially reconciled. Again, he's saying that if this is true, then everyone should be saved. That's not what the scriptures say. See, you're making it come to the wrong conclusion. Yes, God died for the sins of the world, but now it's your choice to receive that gift or not. Another one, 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now let me ask you a question. It's a pretty simple one. How many in here, in here are sinners? So that means Christ died for you, right? And that means he died for every single person on this planet because every single person on this planet is a sinner. It, it's simple. This is not complicated. And yet... For the Calvinist or Reformed theology, this is higher knowledge, and you just don't understand it. Okay, I don't, because it doesn't go with the scriptures. There is no, no such thing as limited atonement or atonement that Christ died, shed his blood for only a few people, the elect. That's foolish. The fourth point, I, irresistible grace. And this is speaking of those who whom God has chosen, God's grace, they cannot reject it. If you're going to get saved, there's nothing you can do about it, in other words. And if you're not going to get saved, there, you can't, there's nothing you're going to do about it. That paints God in a, a bad light. God does save man, the election of God, but man must choose to receive the gift, the free will of man. How do we reconcile that in our minds? Because that's some of our problem. We have to think about this and say, well, I gotta reconcile this, I gotta understand it. I'm sorry, there are a lot of things I just don't understand with my mind, but I believe by faith. The Trinity. How can one God be manifested in three distinct persons? Well, fire, or, uh, water, ice, and, and uh, steam. Well, okay, but it just doesn't work. I mean, that's a, a great analogy, but how does that all work? How does God always exist? Can you tell me that God, how does he always exist? You mean you don't know that? Do you believe it? Why? By faith. Because that's what the Bible says. How do I understand election and free will? I don't. But I believe it because that's what the scriptures tell me. I, don't, I can't reconcile the two. It's not 50% election, 50% uh, free will. I put them together and presto, I'm saved. I, I don't believe that's how it works. It's 100% for both. And the best way that I can explain it is like this. Think of railroad tracks running side by side. Both tracks are needed for what? To move the train forward to get to the destination that it's going, correct? Now. Picture one of the tracks being the sovereignty of God, the election of God, the other track being man's free will. The tracks run parallel to each other. They never intersect each other. They run parallel side by side. And as we place our lives on these tracks, as we are saved, these tracks will lead us to the destination, Jesus Christ in heaven, right? To me, that's the simplest way to explain it. 
They're taking me home. Election, free will, side by side, leading me to the Lord. Again, George Bryson kind of drives this point home with this illustration. It says, the difference between the Calvinist and the non-Calvinist, or the Biblicist, view is not in the fact that Calvinists say that God irresistibly enables us to believe the gospel. Rather, it is that they say God irresistibly makes us the elect believe make us, the elect, believe, or if you prefer, makes us believers. The Calvinist view is also differentiated in two ways. Calvinists deny that many sinners are enabled by God to believe. They also affirm by implication that some are decreed by God to unbelieve, and it's a horrible consequence for all eternity. To help make this very important distinction as clear as possible, consider the following analogy. Suppose there's a man stranded on an island without water or food. Suppose that the pilot of a plane flies over the island and drops by parachute water and food to the stranded man. Without the water and food supplied by the pilot, the stranded man would have died in just a matter of a few days. Without the help of the pilot, the stranded man is not able to drink or eat. Without the help of the pilot, the stranded man is able to eat and drink. The ability of the stranded man to drink and eat is directly re related to the to and dependent upon the provisions dropped onto the island by the pilot. If the stranded man is to benefit from those provisions and live, however, he must choose to drink the water and eat the food. The fact that he can do so does not guarantee that he will do so. This is how the non-Calvinist views the offer of salvation. All lost men can believe and be saved and in fact are called upon to do so. Some do and some don't. Now he says, suppose there's a man in a hospital unconscious and dying of dehydration and starvation. In such a helpless state, the doctor on duty decides to rehydrate and feed the man intravenously. Only after this man is revived is he able to drink and eat on his own. This is how the Calvinist views the salvation process. You do not choose to believe, but you are chosen to believe. According to Reformed theology, if a man believes, it is because he was chosen to believe. The choice a man makes to believe is merely the effect of which the prior choice by God is the cause. And again, I think irresistible grace goes against what the scriptures are teaching. Remember when Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 37, was looking over at Jerusalem? And he, he was weeping. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones, those who were sent to her. How I often wanted to gather you, your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You weren't willing. You see, I want you to notice that it was not that they were unable to do so. They were unwilling to do so. It was a choice. Hebrews 4, 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's a choice, isn't it? Calvinism believes that the non-elect have no choice in the matter. Their hearts are hardened. They cannot and will not hear his voice. And yet the scriptures tell us, don't harden your hearts. What does that mean? That means it's something I can do. I'm hearing the gospel message. I don't want to hear it anymore. Get out of my face. You're hardening your heart to the gospel. That's a choice on your part. And think about it. If it's not your responsibility, if there's nothing you could do to get saved, then who's at fault? God is dirty, rotten God. He condemned me to hell. He gave me no choice. Is that the God you serve? It's not the God I serve. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And really, if this were true, then we could blame God for where we're going. It's not my fault. And it is. It's our choice. Why should I be punished for something I was predestined for? Think about that. God created me for hell. That's not what it says. So this irresistible grace, point four, is not scriptural, and yet many hold on to these teachings. The fifth and last one is P, perseverance of the saints. And the idea here is once the elect are saved, they will, in, they will live a life of holiness for the most part for the rest of their life. And I always like how, for the most part, they put that in there. For, for the most part. I don't, I'm not even sure what that means, but okay. They'll, they'll, they'll be pretty good. Once, you know, it's kind of a once saved, always saved, that you can't lose your salvation, which I believe you can't lose your salvation. 
But Talbot and Crampton explain it like this. It should be obvious that the Calvinist doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is not one and the same thing as once saved, always saved. So many Christians say, well, I believe that, you know, like Calvinism, that once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't lose your salvation. But there's a twist that Calvinism puts on it that I don't think you would agree with. I don't believe with it. I don't think you could lose your salvation. And I think there's a lot of scriptures that support that. But again, I don't think that the Calvinist view is, is correct. George Bryson again says, Accord, according to Reformed theology, theology, just as faith in Christ is irresistible for the elect, so a consistent lifelong faithlessness to Christ mostly is in, <coughs> inevitably for the regenerated. Calvinist John Murray argues, a believer cannot abandon himself to sin. He cannot come under the dominion of sin. He cannot be guilty of certain kinds of unfaithfulness. Now, what does that say? Certain kinds of unfaithfulness. That means, can I know that I'm saved? No. You may blow it. And then you're not saved. You didn't lose your salvation because for the Calvinist, you were never saved. How do you know that? Because you look at what you just did. Now again, we don't know what these, these kinds of unfaithfulness are because they don't explain it. I, I again think that paints God in a very bad picture. John Piper says, we, not, we do not breathe easy after a person has prayed to receive Christ. There is a fight of faith to be fought. We must endure to the end in faith if we are to be saved. What John Piper is saying is, look, if you sin some unfaithfulness that we're not really sure what that is, it's going to show that you weren't saved in the first place. But I thought Christ died for all my sins. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you can come to Christ and just live any way that you want. That's not what I'm saying. But let's face it. How many of you in here, after you got saved, have sinned? And if you're not raising your hand, you're a liar, so you just sinned again. That's the reality. God is still working in us, right? And that's going to happen until we go and be with him. But in their minds, you can not lose your salvation, but just show that you weren't saved in the first place. If you sin, you're not part of the elect. And so, again, you have no idea where you're going. You could serve the Lord all your life, and at the end do some unfaithfulness, whatever that is, and you're not saved. So you really don't know where you're going. Well, if you're saved, you're going to live a good life. Well, yeah, but how are you doing with that? And if you say good, let's, let's see if we could project what's in your heart on the screen here. And I guarantee you none of us would want that be, to be shown. None of us. And if you say, yes, I do, you're a liar. You see, we're, I hate to say it, we are a work in pro progress. God's not done with us. The work he began in us, he is going to complete. I mean, you could read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. Paul is speaking to Christians, and he's warning them not to go back to the old life, which tells me that Christians are capable of committing those things that Paul was warning of in Ephesians chapter 5. Don't go back there. Don't go back in that stuff. And so the whole idea of perseverance of the saints, I don't believe is scriptural. And out of the five points of Calvinism, I agree with zero. None of them. Now what Calvinists or Reformed theology people like to say is, and I've heard this so much, well, if you're not a Calvinist, then you must be an Arminianist. Oh, what does that mean now? I just got Calvinism down. And this is what they'll throw at you. And they'll tell you, Arminianism, I'll just give you just a quick background. Jacob Herman from 1560 to 1609 is best known for his Latin name, Arminius. And he had some doubts about the teachings of John Calvin. John Calvin was 1509 to 1564. Again, what did people do for 1,500 years before this stuff was invented? Who knows? But he didn't believe in eternal security. He believed you could lose your salvation. In fact, after his death, they came up with the five points of Arminianism. Great, you know, we got ten points now here. Now here's what people will say. 
Well, Pastor Joe, if you're not a Calvinist, and if you're not an Arminianist, what are you? I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Why are you categorizing me? Why are you putting me in this group or this group? I'm not in any group. I'm in with Jesus. It's real simple. It is written, period. Why, you, why do I have to be in a certain group? I'm sorry. And again, I, I don't want to offend any of you. I just want you to think this stuff through. You think it through in your mind. If God has elected only a few, the flip coin is that God has also predestined others to go to hell. He's created them specifically for that. And that's not the God I serve. Not at all. Now, let's think about this a little bit. If we're going to go out and witness, if we're going to spread the gospel, of, or the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, we better know what the gospel is about. And the gospel is not Calvinism. The gospel is not Reformed theology. Jesus shed his blood for the sins of the world and that every person on this planet has an opportunity to receive that gift of grace that is found in Christ. And that's the gospel we're to share. It's a choice that people have. In fact, Charles Spurgeon said, there's no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless you preach what is called Calvinism. It is a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. And, you know, I... I don't get Spurgeon because Spurgeon witnessed to how many thousands of people, right? I don't get it. But the gospel isn't Calvinism because think about it. If the gospel is Calvinism, what did we do for some 1,500 plus years before the gospel came or Calvinism came? You see, again, it doesn't make any sense. John Piper claims the doctrines of grace, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints are the wrap in the woof of the biblical gospel that so many saints have cherished for centuries. I disagree with that. See, now we're linking the gospel message to Calvinism, and what's the gospel message linked to? Jesus Christ. It's about him. It's not about Calvin. You're not going to go to heaven. I believe Calvin was right. And Jesus is going to go, what? <laughs> really? I fixed Calvin when he came up here. I washed his brain. Now he believes that. <laughs> no, sorry. Paul warned the, warned the church in Galatia about moving away from the gospel. He said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached, you let him be accursed. Wow. Is the gospel of Calvinism, the five points of Calvinism, the gospel that Paul preached, the ones that the Galatians believed when they turned to the Lord? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's a different gospel if you believe. If you believe Calvinism is the gospel message, there's a big problem. Turn over to 1 Corinthians for a minute. Chapter 15. And listen to what Paul said. We're going to pick up in verse 1 because here's the gospel in a nutshell. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you which also you received and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel means good news. And yeah, it could be any good news, but specifically here it's the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. That's the great news in a world that's dark, discouraging, without hope. But how could you hold that message out to people if God only elected a certain few? You can't. Some of you may remember L. Ron Hubbard. He was a science fiction writer. He and a man uh, got together, decided to make up a religion called Scientology. And you know, his commercials are, you know, you don't see them on TV anymore, but remember, you know, you have this problem, turn to page whatever in the book of Scientology, and, you know, it, it had your answers, and L. Ron Hubbard committed suicide. 
I'm thinking, you know, his book really didn't help him. That was very sad. But it, look at how many people follow him. This religion was born out of the heart of man, not from God. Paul tells us that the gospel didn't originate from his own heart. This is not something Paul came up with in his own mind. In fact, in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12, he said, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Some guy didn't come up with this idea. For I neither received it from man, nor as I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul was given this revelation by Jesus himself. God spoke to him. After he got saved on the road to Damascus, those years that he, God was teaching him and training him. And it's the same message that the scriptures talk about. That's the gospel he wanted to give to the people in Corinth. The good news. And that's what we're to bring to people. Forget the doctrines of man. Calvinism doesn't have good news. Well, I guess it has good news for the elect, but not for all the people of this world. And am I so special that God chose me? Now they would say, well, no, you're not special. God just chose you. But that means God chose others for hell. And I don't know. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life because the son didn't come into this world to condemn the world but to, that the world through him might be saved. And you know what the world means? The people of this world, every single person on this planet. Why do we have to come up? It's kind of like Genesis chapter 1. Oh, you know, the word day doesn't mean day. It means millions of years. Oh, really? Well, why does it say evening and morning were the first day? Well, you know, that was just the story. No, it's not. And when it says God so loved the world, he's talking about all the people of this world, not just a select few. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes. You present to them Jesus. You don't present to them Calvin or Arminianism. Present Jesus. What did he say? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all these things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. That's what we are to do. That is the gospel message. And, you know, Jude said, that we have to earnestly contend for the faith that has been entrusted to us. It was interesting listening to John MacArthur because he talked about years ago when he was young with his dad, he never heard anyone talk about Reformed theology. And yet today it's everywhere and it's just this gift from heaven. And I disagree. You see, as you read Reformed theology, even Adam didn't have a choice. God predestined him to sin. Now again, let's think about that. If Adam was predestined to sin, how could God blame him for it? I created you to sin. And, and guess what? You sinned. And now you're punished because you sinned. Well, that's not right. And yet that's what Calvinism is teaching. I think we have a glorious gospel. Why do we have to change it? I don't care if people think I'm stupid. I don't care if they don't think I'm an intellectual. I just know what the scriptures say. I don't have to have any degrees on my wall or anything. I know the creator of heaven and earth. And I'll tell you what. I remember years ago, Pastor Raul Reese, this is years ago, probably, what, 30 years ago or so, he was you know, he would study and study and you know he was so excited because the Lord showed or not the Lord but in his commentaries that he was reading he got these great insights into passages he was studying and he went to visit this older woman she was like in her 80s or 90s you know he went to visit her and he was talking with her and he was she was just sharing with him and he was she was sharing everything that he had learned and he's like wow what commentary did you read and she said. I didn't read a commentary, I read the Bible. And God showed her these things. See, why do I need 
man to tell me to believe in another man. I just need God by his spirit to open his word up to my heart and my life. And I think, you know, we spent, I don't know, a year and a half or so in the Gospel of Matthew talking about the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a glorious study it's been. At least it has been for me. I hope it's been for you. We are going to, as we end with the Great Commission here, next week we are going to pick up in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the birth of the church. And it is the obedience to the Great Commission. Is That's what we're seeing. Going out into the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And I'm really excited as we go through the books of, of Acts. I, I pray that it spurs us on to fulfill what God has called us to do. To go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them and teaching them. And remembering that the Lord is with us wherever we go. Powerful lessons in the book of Acts of what the church is all about. In fact, the first message I ever gave on Sunday morning some, what, 18 and a half years ago at Calvary Chapel was from the book of Acts, and it was what the church was all about, Acts chapter 2. And it hasn't changed in 18 and a half years. Why? Because God hasn't changed. He keeps it simple. This is what the church is about. Do it. What a, what a glorious God we have. We can't blame him for what we do. It's our choice. But boy, his love is extended to all of us. And that free gift of life is there for our taking. We just have to receive that into our life. We need to repent of our sins and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in our lives. The good news. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord that you are so gracious and merciful, that your love is extended to every single person on this planet, that that free gift of life is there for us to receive by faith, that your death on the cross of Calvary paid in full all of our sins, but we must appropriate that into our lives by faith, by believing in you, receiving you into our lives, repenting of our sins. Lord, if there are any here this morning or listen on the radio, the internet, that haven't done that. I just pray, Lord, work on their hearts, soften them, help them to see you and your great love for them, that you want them to enter into eternity with you, Lord. And for all of us, we just are so grateful, so thankful that, Lord, you've extended that gift to, to us as well. And, Lord, help us to go out with that good news of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.